we're going to begin a consideration of the cardiovascular system by returning to cardiac muscle. Now, we've already talked about how cardiac muscle compares to skeletal muscle in terms of its excitation contraction coupling. But our return now um, with a focus on cardiac muscle is going to focus on a particular property, and that is the fatigue resistance of cardiac muscle. Your heart beats about 100,000 times a day, which amounts to 35 million contractions in a year and billions of contractions in a lifetime. And it never stops. Your heart has to continue beating or you'll die. Essentially, chemical diffusion is not sufficient to transport nutrients to the cells that need it and dissolve gases as well. And when your circulation ceases, then your cells, like your brain cells, for example, with their very high metabolism, start to die uh, almost instantly. So you cannot afford for the cardiac muscle that your heart is largely composed of to fatigue. And so the question for this mini, le mini lecture is, how does the heart avoid exhaustion? Now we're going to talk about three levels of security, essentially, in the design of your heart that help prevent exhaustion. And the first focuses on the pacemaker cells of the heart. So let's focus schematically on the two types of cells that we're going to talk about. The pacemaker cells are known as autorhythmic cells or autorhythmic myocardial cells, and they are responsible for creating the heart's beat. And um, it can be modulated um, through the um, autonomic nervous system, which we'll talk about in a bit. But the autorhythmic cells themselves, just one cell is capable of creating that heartbeat. And the action potentials generated by the autorhythmic cells then propagate through the contractile cells, which in addition to propagating the action potential through other contractile cells, generate force. So when we talk about cardiac muscle, we're referring to these contractile cells or myocardial contractile cells. We're going to start with the autorhythmic cells. So we're going to perform one of our virtual experiments where we monitor the membrane potential, in this case of an autorhythmic cell, and we look at how that membrane changes over time. And without exposing it to any kind of a stimulus, these cells will, on their own, and this is what we mean by an autonomous activation, will depolarize. You have this gradual increase in membrane potential, which is known as the pacemaker potential. Now, when the potential, the membrane potential, reaches a threshold of minus, in this case, 40 millivolts, then an action potential begins. This is sort of like an action potential in a neuron, but in slow motion. Note the time scale there. It's over a half a second um, spanning the entire x-axis. Now, like the action potential of a neuron, once it has been tripped, it cannot be reactivated. It has a refractory period. And it's fixed in its duration. So what that means is that the autorhythmic cell is incapable of generating action potentials any more frequently than what would happen if you had a zero pacemaker potential, if you just were to stack up action potentials right after each other then that still is not terribly frequent. And the pacemaker potential is modulated in its duration. And again, we'll talk about that later. But the action potential is fixed. Now, the means of chain changing the membrane potential plays similar games that we've become familiar with from a consideration of um, other excitable tissues. Um, although the particular channels that are involved are new to us. So during the rise of the pacemaker potential, the ion flux that generates that is a combination of sodium and potassium. So this channel called the IF channel, it's F for funny because at the time 
the behavior was kind of unusual. It has a threshold of minus 60 millivolts. So we begin right there when, and by the way, this is showing us just one pacemaker and one action potential. So the next beat would begin with another pacemaker potential that starts at that point. So once the cell has repolarized from the prior action potential, that will trigger the IF channels to open. And like the nicotinic receptors in the motor end plate of skeletal muscle, this channel allows for flux of both sodium and potassium, but more sodium than potassium. And as a consequence, you get a depolarization, not a hyperpolarization. Now, once the membrane has reached that threshold of minus 40 millivolts, then voltage-gated calcium channels become activated. Calcium has a similar behavior as sodium in that it has a, a positive equilibrium potential and a higher concentration on the exterior of the cell. So when that channel opens, calcium will tend to move into the cell. The repolarization, as you might expect, is driven by potassium. Now it's a relatively slow potassium channel, but again, it's voltage gated. It has a threshold of a, of a high positive membrane potential. And so when it is triggered, then potassium floods out of the cell and that serves to repolarize the membrane. So the fixed duration of this action potential serves as a safety measure to help avoid exhaustion of the contractile cells that the autorhythmic cells are connected to. That long action potential limits the beat frequency, essentially provides a ceiling for the beat frequency. And it's caused by the calcium and, and potassium channels that I just explained. Okay, so the autorhythmic cells provide a means or a safety measure from avoiding exhaustion by virtue of um, serving as an upper limit to the beat frequency that is possible. The contractile cells themselves have safety measures as well. And for that, we're gonna compare the behavior of a myocardial contractile cell to skeletal muscle fibers. So we've already talked about this physiological experiment where we take a single muscle fiber, we bathe it in physiological saline, and we run electrical current through that saline to generate force. And in this case, monitor the membrane potential of that contractile cell. So this is a recording electrode, not a stimulating electrode. So when we play a stimulus into the physiological saline, we can now monitor the membrane potential that results from that. And for skeletal muscle, we didn't do this before when we were presenting skeletal muscle because it's kind of trivial. The skeletal muscle just reflects the changes or the depolarizations uh, that are driven by our stimulus. And then we have the tension that we're familiar with from an earlier lecture where we have a single twitch, then we're illustrating summation through a succession of action potentials. Let's compare that to a myocardial contractile cell. We're gonna measure both the tension and also the membrane potential that results from the same um, series of action potentials that we're gonna to use to stimulate the cell. Now, the first thing that you see that is different is what the membrane potential looks like. It maintains a depolarization and that serves or reflects a refractory period. So for this really long duration, note the time scale here, that's a quarter of a second or 250 milliseconds. For that duration of the refractory period, the tension is generated over that time scale. All right, that's the twitch for a myocardial contractile cell. Note that it's longer in duration from the skeletal muscle fiber. We're spanning almost three twitches uh, for the skeletal muscle fiber for the, with that duration. And this refractory period is triggered by that first action potential. Then when the subsequent um, second and third action potentials arrive, they have no effect on the membrane. The membrane is insensitive. 
Okay, that's what it means to be within a refractory period. So this tension would be the same if there were just one action potential, three action potentials, 15 action potentials, it doesn't matter because the contractile cell is insensitive to the action potentials that follow that first action potential. And that is true for the entire duration, the whole one quarter second period of the refractory period. Once the cell has reset, that is beyond the refractory period, then it can be activated again. And so when we send a high frequency of action potentials, we see again that depolarization is driven by that initial action potential. And then once the cell has repolarized, then it can be activated again, but it cannot be activated at the times in between. These action potentials have no effect on the contractile cell. And as a consequence, when you look at tension, it follows that fixed duration of a quarter of a second. So even if the autorhythmic cells fail and somehow feed a super high um, train of action potentials, which we know they shouldn't because they have their own refractory period, but if, if somehow they could, then the contractile cells are resistant to those extra excitations high frequency of action potentials cannot result in contraction because of the refractory period that we see here. So the refractory period guards against fatigue. Now I'm not going to show you a schematic of the voltage gated channels that generate the refractory period, but I will just tell you that they're generated again by calcium channels, much like the autorhythmic cells and um, low potassium permeability. So you essentially have a depolarization that's being driven by calcium and a depressed potassium permeability. Okay, so both the autorhythmic and the contractile cells have these measures to help avoid exhaustion. There's a third measure that is more at the organ level. So let's return our attention to skeletal muscles. So this is supposed to be a schematic of a biceps muscle. So on the left, we have the contracted state, and then on the right, we have it fully extended. And just think about, you can sort of do it on your own, you can play along, and just think about contractions of your biceps muscle. Okay, they contract, your, your hand elevates, and it relaxes. Your, maybe your triceps mu uh, muscle drives the extension of your arm so that your, your hand lowers. All throughout, the length changes of the muscle, whether activated or being extended, are constrained by the elbow joint. They're also constrained by where the muscle inserts on the bones. Um, and as a consequence, what you have is the anatomy of the arm affecting the lengths that the muscles can achieve. So in other words, the elbow joint restricts the range of muscle lengths that are achieved. So when you look at the length tension relationship for muscle, as might be measured in an isometric experiment like we've considered with the kind of experimental preparation we see on the left, we got a relationship that looks like this. And what we can say is that the elbow joint allows almost this full range of changes in length by the muscle fibers within the biceps muscle. And we're gonna call that the anatomical range because it's a function of in vivo, the range of length changes that your anatomy allows. So for skeletal muscle, if you look at the anatomy of your skeleton and where the muscles are attached, it turns out that the, the geometry of the skeleton allows for length changes that almost span the full length tension relationship. All right, so this is the story for skeletal muscle, an anatomical range that allows for almost a full length tension relationship. The length changes of the myocardial contractile cells or the cardiac muscle cells um, are restricted in a different way. They are not actually connected to any skeletal joint, 
Now, the length tension relationship of these cells is similar. After all, these cells have uh, sarcomeres and they generate tension in a similar way to the skeletal muscle. So when you extract a single cell, like this one that we see here on the left, and you me measure its length tension relationship, then you get a curve that looks something like that. Okay, the slopes are different. The slope is actually meaningful in terms of its function. You see that for any increase in length, you get a greater increase in tension because the slope continuously increases. So for any lengthening or expansion in the chambers of the heart, you're gonna get more tension back out of it. All right, so that does matter. But in general, you see that there's a rise and then a decline, just like the length tension relationship in skeletal muscle. But these length differences are not driven by the same kind of muscle antagonism that you see in the skeletal muscle. Instead, the heart, as it's changing uh, the volume of the chambers as they fill up with blood, drive the extensions and length. So we're gonna get into all the details of the heart anatomy later on, but what you need to know is that most of what you see here is, um, is cardiac muscle tissue. There's also a lot of connective tissue. And just imagine being a cardiac muscle cell in the wall of this ventricle right here. At this point, in the cardiac cycle, the, the period of time that the heart beats and relaxes, the chamber has just contracted and is now has now begun filling up with blood. Okay, so that means that for this geometry, we would be on the left-hand side of this length tension relationship. Now, as that chamber fills up with blood, we can see these walls expand and the muscle tissue that comprise, largely, comprise the wall of that chamber have now expanded, like filling up a water balloon. That means that we've gone from a short length now to a long length, and then when the muscle is activated, then it will go back or run back down this curve and go to the shorter length. Okay, so blood filling the chambers extend the length of the muscle. Another factor is all the connective tissue that surrounds the contractile cells constrain the extent to which the muscles can be elongated. So in this respect, we have an anatomical range that's not created by the geometry of a joint in your skeleton, but instead by the connective tissue that, that surrounds the contractile cells. So as a consequence of all that connective tissue, the anatomical range of the contractile cells is much more narrow than we see in the case of skeletal muscle cells. Now, why is this relevant? Well, imagine the alternative. What would happen as the ventricle expanded if it drove the contractile cells to this part of the length tension relationship. When the ventricles fill, the more that they fill up with blood, the more that the walls need to generate pressure and therefore force in order to expel that blood. So essentially, the more that it fills up, the more force that you're going to need to clear the blood that has entered that chamber. That's a real problem if the length tension relationship is such as it is, where it increases up to a, 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 an optimal length, but then declines. Because if we had a drop off in tension, the ventricles would be filled up and we'd be generating less and less pressure to clear out those chambers. So we don't want that. We, we essentially want a measure to avoid the physiological length tension relationship that we see in green here. And that's provided by the anatomical range. By restricting the range of lengths that can be achieved, then we're only in a region of positive slopes in the length tension relationship. In other words, the more you extend the muscle, the more force that you get out of it. And for any increase, 
you get more of a change in tension. So the heart anatomy limits the anatomical range and that prevents a drop off in tension at the high muscle lengths. It's another measure to avoid fatigue because the muscles would be fatigued uh, by this inability to clear out the chambers. There's an additional benefit to the anatomical range that has to do with how the cardiac muscle functions in vivo during real heartbeats. And that was classically demonstrated by experiments on the heart of a dog. And this experiment's rather simple. On the y-axis, we have the stroke volume. That's the volume of blood that emerges from the heart, that is through the aorta during a heartbeat. So that's how much you get out of the heart. The x-axis is the amount of blood right before the contraction begins. So it's the volume in the ventricle at the end of diastole. So the ventricular end diastolic volume, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it just means how much blood the vent is filled up in the ventricle before contraction. So in the length tension relationship on the left, the end diastolic volume would correspond to when the muscles are lengthened the most. They're the most, the ventricles are the most inflated and therefore the muscles are the greatest extended at that point in the cardiac cycle. The stroke volume can be less than, or should be less than that volume because not all blood leaves the heart. There's always some residual volume of blood at the end of the contraction left behind. Now, the way this experiment was performed was to inflate this heart, which had been extracted from a dead uh, animal, and to inflate the ventricle to varying degrees and then stimulate it to contract and measure um, how much blood emerged from the heart. And the relationship initially is linear. And that's the case up to the resting value. And by resting, I mean the, the values for both the stroke volume and the ventricular end diastolic volume uh, when the uh, dog is not exercising. So those values appear there. So it's a linear relationship. And that linear relationship largely continues at higher volumes, which are achieved uh, when the activity of the animal increases. So it looks like that. Eventually, you get diminishing returns such that there's a leveling off of that slope. And so you're getting less and less stroke volume, less and less blood out of the system for more and more um, blood being pumped into the ventricle. So it still remains a positive slope, but it, it levels off. You're basically getting diminishing returns in the effort. Now, what this implies is a couple of things. First of all, in order for more blood to emerge from the heart, there has to be greater pressure generated in the ventricle. So greater pressures are achieved only through generating more force. So as you inflate the ventricle further, you're pushing on the length tension relationship, the position before contraction further to the right. If, if not for the anatomical range, what would happen is that there would actually be a drop off in force as you continue to the right. But because of all of the elastic tissue that prevents a movement into the right part of the length tension relationship, that doesn't happen. So instead, with more pulling on the muscles, greater end diastolic volume, you get more force, more tension out of the system. And in fact, because the length tension relationship has an increasing positive slope, for as you pull it further, you get 
a disproportionate increase in the tension that's generated when the muscle is activated. Now this also demonstrates the ability of cardiac contractile cells to increase their twitch tension. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that uh, later when we consider the control of uh, the cardiovascular system. But twitch tension can increase in cardiac muscle cells. It's not something you see in skeletal muscle cells. So the length tension relationship on the left is what you can measure on single cells. And on the right, you see one large functional benefit to that length tension relationship and the anatomical range. And this is known as the Frank Starling law. Okay, so let's get back to the initial question that we set out to address. How does the heart avoid exhaustion given that it contracts so many times in a lifetime? We've seen three measures that help avoid exhaustion. First of all, in the autorhythmic cells, we have the fixed duration of the action potentials. That prevents the heart rate from driving the contractile cells at too high a frequency. Within the contractile cells themselves, we have that prevented also through the refractory period. We can't activate the muscle fibers at a greater frequency than is what, than what is permitted by that refractory period. And finally, we have at the organ level, this anatomical range, which prevents the hyperextension of muscle, which would cause a catastrophic drop in tension.